Hey, I'm Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Emergence Church, and we are glad that you are tuning in to join or check out one of our worship services. Uh, this is a service from our Thursday night service, and our hope is that it's an encouragement to your faith. We also hope if you're not plugged into a local church, that that would be a priority. Church is a, a huge gift from God to us. And while we can have things to resource our discipleship, like online services, they're never a replacement for actually joining and committing to a local church. If you are in New Jersey, we'd love to have you come check us out one Thursday night or one Sunday morning at any of our services in any of our locations, and you can find that online. And now um, it is uh, a hope that you would be blessed by this service.
Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome. declaration that we can make together uh, tonight. Father, we worship you, God. We thank you uh, for who you are, for what you've done, God. And we just declare, I believe uh, in God, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the, the work that you're doing in and through us, God, transforming us more into the likeness of Jesus. God, I thank you that, that you... Uh, you draw us in, God, by your spirit, Father. Despite our brokenness, despite our frailty, God, we thank you for the love that you have for us and that you demonstrated for us in giving us Jesus, sending him to come and as a sacrifice for us, God. We worship you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Man, so good to, to be able to worship together tonight. As we gather each week, if you're a guest with us, we're glad that you're here. Uh, as we gather each week, we worship in a number of different ways. Uh, we worship through singing songs together like we just did. We worship together through opening God's Word, studying Scripture together. We're in a series in John right now. And, uh, and we, we worship through being generous, uh, through pooling our resources to, uh, to be a blessing, not only uh, in this local area, uh, through you know, our, our congregation and through other uh, church plants that we've helped uh, plant over the years and, uh, and others that, that we support and missionaries that we support around the globe, uh, where we can do more than, uh, than what we do on our own as we uh, work together uh, to, to help the gospel go forth. We don't pass a plate or anything. We have boxes in the back. Most of us give online, but if you're a guest with us, we're not asking you to, to give. We're just glad that you're here. Uh, and we actually have a gift for you if you stop by the Connect desk uh, after service. Uh, there's people with blue shirts that says, how can I help you? Let them know that you're a, a, a first-time guest and we have a, a small gift for you that we would love to get into your hands just as a appreciation for coming and uh, worshiping with us tonight. So uh, let's take a few moments to, to greet one another and then you can have a seat. I'm Mike. And here's everything you need to know about what's happening at Emergence. It's the big week. Yay! Easter's just one week away, and we are praying for a huge weekend of new life and opportunities to see more people find hope and make a decision to follow Jesus. Yes, and here's a quick rundown of all that is going on this week. Just a reminder, we are not having Thursday night service this week, but we're going to meet on Good Friday for a time of guided prayer and communion as a church. At 4 and 5.30 on Friday, we'll get together for a special prayer meeting. We'll have a chance to reflect on the cross, examine our hearts, take communion, and pray for those who will be joining us next weekend. Yes, and E-Town will be available, but only at 4 p.m., not 5.30. So if you have young ones, plan to come early. 
We'll prepare our hearts to celebrate well, and that's what we're going to do starting next Saturday. We have eight Easter services that will begin at 4 p.m. on Saturday in Totowa, and then continue on Sunday in both Ringwood and Totowa. 8, 9, 15, 10, 30, and 11, 45 in Totowa, and 9, 10, 20, and 11, 40 in Ringwood. Yes, so bring your family and bring a friend. It's going to be such a great weekend of celebrating Jesus' victory. We've got a few mugs left, so if you haven't yet mugged your neighbor with an invite, this is your last chance. Yes, you'd never know what God might do through a simple gift. Some of the people here in this right now are here because of a mug, like me. Grab a mug with an invite card or a kid safe mug with an invite egg if they have kids, and then pray that God uses it. On the other side of Easter, two quick reminders for you. Our marriage workshop is April 13th in Totowa from 9 a.m. to noon. While it's a great chance for anyone, single or married, to grow and be encouraged, it also might be a great opportunity to invite someone you know who could use the encouragement as well. So check out the details and register on the digital bulletin today for the workshop. And while you're there, you can also check out all of our community groups. We have a new season of groups starting on April 7th, right after Easter. So now is a great time to find one to connect with. Yes, there are groups all over North Jersey on all different days of the week and they all exist for you to connect with others and be encouraged to grow in Jesus. So take a step this spring and plug in. For more info on any of that or anything else going on in the church, check out this week's news on the digital bulletin. You can use the QR code in the chair in front of you to get there. It's a big week. Can't wait to see how God uses it. Let's keep on loving Jesus, loving people, and plowing a counterculture. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you guys, and we're going to be in John chapter 2 tonight. Awesome, awesome text. Before we jump into it, just want to say next weekend is Easter. It's going to be awesome. Easter Saturday, we were talking before that actually, because we're like, man, he rose tomorrow, but actually, I think timeline will be like even with Jerusalem. So like, it'll be the most biblical of all the services. And so you want to be there uh, Saturday night. It's going to be awesome. And so Easter Saturday begins next Saturday night. Next Sunday, a whole bunch of services. And, uh, and do just want to say, uh, our, our hope as a church, if, if you're someone who this is your church, is that if you're able to, we have a lot of guests coming next weekend. There's a lot of folks who this is their church service, you know, once or twice twice a year they're going to do this thing, and, uh, and we want to we love them well. Uh, we want to hope that we can help that number raise, and more importantly, that they would come to know Jesus and they'd plug into a church somewhere, and so we want to be good hosts. And as part of that, I, I do just want to ask if, if you have time next week that our, our big prayer is that, you know, that a lot of us would step in and we would both worship at a service and we'd serve at a service. And so uh, I'd ask you to pray about that. If you're married with your spouse, uh, it takes some time this week to pray about what's it look like for us. Do we have the time next weekend, whether it's Saturday and Sunday, whether it's on Sunday, whether it's Saturday night, uh, what's, what would it look like for us to carve out some time to, to worship at a service and to serve at a service to try to be the best hosts we can possibly be because there's going to be a whole bunch of people coming in and we're just praying for miraculous space somehow. And so, um, you know, it might be, it might be three to a chair. And so, you know, uh, get ready. It's going to be, it's going to be a blast and I'm praying for that. Um, th this week, last week we got to saw, see Jesus go to a wedding and change a bunch of water to wine supernaturally. Uh, today he's going to go to a temple and take out a whip. Uh, it's going to go from like wine to a fight. Some of you guys are like, that's my family reunion. And um, it's not, it's a little different than that. Uh, it's, an awesome text because Jesus goes into the temple, and this is really interesting about John's gospel because John actually has the cleansing of the temple up in the beginning of his gospel account. 
Most of the gospel accounts that talk about the temple cleansing, it's in the final week of Jesus' life. So it's actually pretty awesome that today is Palm Sunday, Thursday. And the reason it's awesome is because uh, this seems to be the event in a lot of the gospel accounts that really sets up the, the week, the, the last week of Jesus' life. In fact, one of the things they, they mock him with on the cross is something he's going to say in the text tonight about the cleansing of the temple. Now, there's some debate about this, about, you know, why do the Simnachs? Synoptics have Jesus cleansing the temple at the, why do the other gospels, big, big word for other gospels, why do the other gospels have the cleansing of the temple at the end of their account, and why does John have it at the beginning? Two big theories. One is uh, John put it up front for literary purposes because there's something he's setting up, some themes he's setting up that he wants to lump together, and that's, that's a totally normal thing for uh, this time, that type of writing, for it to be out of chronological order, but for literary purposes, for him to put it forward. It's it's also quite possible Jesus did this more than once. Uh, Remember, Jesus travels, he speaks, he says a lot of times similar things in different places, and it's quite possible he cleansed the temple early in the ministry, he cleansed the temple later in the ministry. Uh, Either way, the main thing stays the main thing. And so we're going to see this incredible account tonight where Jesus cleanses the temple. And so let's look at it together. It says, as the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And so it's the time of Passover. And so what happens is uh, a lot of the people from the community come into the center of Jerusalem because they're going to worship for the Passover. Because of this, the population swells massively. So picture for us in New Jersey, right? Picture 4th of July, Jersey Shore, okay? So what happens? 4th of July, Jersey Shore, all the people come in, you know, the people have shore houses. The, the rich people of shore houses and uh, the Philly trash, you know, all comes in. And no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, but I'm serious. And um, <laughs> kids who are partying come in and everything comes in and, and the population swells and there's people there with good intentions. Uh, there's people there with bad intentions. There's, there's, there's a whole mixed bag. And in, in some ways, as the population comes into to Jerusalem for the, day, for the time of Passover, the, the, the population swells. And in the temple, specifically this place where the people of God were going to come and worship the living God, Jesus is coming into the temple. And what's he find? He finds that it looks like a marketplace, right? There's people there and they're selling animals for sacrifice. And that was, you know, part of the, the stipulation for those who had to travel real far. There's money exchanging for the temple. And so as, as time has gone by, these practices have got, grown corrupt, okay? And so people are, are bringing their animals in and the people who you would buy the animals from, they've grown corrupt. And like anywhere you have a monopoly, they're jacking up the prices significantly. So there's lots of commentators that write about how much more expensive these animals were in the temple than they would be in the street. It's kind of like if you ever go to a a sporting event, you know, a a Giants game or uh, a, a Jets game or something like that. And you buy a hot dog and a soda and some french fries, and it's like $1,000. And you're like, how did that? I've never heard of a $20 hot dog. That's what happens, right, in, in monopolies. And so they're just jacked up to the moon. And the prices of these things have, have become exorbitant. There's also money exchangers there because there's certain currency that you need for the temple. We don't really have something like this in our culture. I was trying to think of a modern equivalent, and the closest I could come up with was Chuck E. Cheese, right? If you go to Chuck E. Cheese, I, I know it's not exactly the same, but if you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you get those little Chuck E. coins, and you can't do anything without those Chuck E. coins. And, but like the hope is, as you're winning prizes, spending all your money, you're getting all these tickets, and you're thinking, oh, I'm cleaning up. I have thousands and thousands of tickets because you can't get your money back, right? You can't just keep the Chucky coins and be like, we didn't spend these. Can I have my $100 back for five Chucky coins? They, they, but they give you this false hope of these tickets. And so you're like, I, you come back with this stack of tickets. You're like, I got a thousand tickets. We're cleaning up. And you, you find out a thousand tickets is like a spider ring and a Jolly Rancher, you know? And that's that's very similar in some ways. As crazy as this is, that's similar to the money exchange rate at the temple. It's jacked up significantly. It's really high cost. And, and here's the heartbreak. We learned this from some of the other gospel accounts. 
All of this is taking place in what's known as the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles was where the Gentiles would come into worship. And so if you're visiting, a Gentile in the Bible is simply anyone who wasn't Jewish, right? It could be African, Asian, European. We're, most of us here, I, I, I would venture 90 plus percent of us at least are Gentiles, right? Uh, we didn't grow up Jewish. And so the Gentiles might hear about this God of salvation, right? That they're going to come in at the Passover because they've heard the story that God saves his people and that God moved mightily in Egypt and he saved his people by them going out and placing the blood of the lamb on their homes and anyone who was covered in the blood of the lamb, God's wrath passed over them and spared them and then he led them out of slavery and he adopted them as his people and every year the people of God come in to Jerusalem and they celebrate God's mighty act and imagine you are curious about this saving God. Could this saving God save me? Is the God of the Bible real and you make the journey out from your hometown to come and to explore is God real is there really a God who saves and suddenly you walk in to the court of the Gentiles where you would worship and what's happening all around you there's corrupt money changers there's corrupt animal sellers and you as you're exploring the God of the Bible start looking around and you know what you conclude this is just business These people don't care about God at all. They're just in this for the money. They don't care about God's glory. They don't care about God's worship. This is no different than the center of town where I'm from, where the people only care about money. There's nothing distinct about these people at all. Now, how do you think Jesus is going to feel about that? Watch what happens. This is pretty... Because if you find yourself, right... A bit repulsed by that. Like the the gathering of the people of God being reduced down to a money-making business. Take heart when you see Jesus' response. Look what happens. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Jesus makes a whip. I don't know how long it takes to make a whip, but he literally sits down and whittles himself a whip. And then he starts chasing the money changers out, the the animals that they're selling out, the animal exchangers out. Now, if you want to do a really interesting, almost comical study, pick up some commentaries on this. And this is literally the debate in the commentaries. They're like, I don't know if Jesus would have chased the people out with the whip. He probably would have only chased the animals out with the whip. If your trade is selling animals, you're not going out without your animals, right? He's chasing everyone out. And I would imagine this is a super tense moment because these are these people's businesses. And it's not just them selling it. I'm sure their whole family's involved. And suddenly Jesus is coming around chasing you out. You got probably got sons sticking up for their fathers and people jumping in. And it's probably a loud argumentative thing. And Jesus is just chasing everyone out because he's furious. He says, my father's house is not a place of trade. Right? Isn't that incredible? This isn't about just making money. Meaning when we gather as a church, the hope is this isn't just a place where you come to make business contacts, right? Where you split up with your partner. You go to this church and I'll go to that church and we'll divide and conquer. We'll try to form relationships in each of these churches. You're not here to build your LinkedIn profile, right? This is the place of God's glory, Right, the, the, the worship of the people of God for the glory of God. And, and when Jesus comes in and he sees that being reduced down to this business, he becomes furious with, with the response. He's angry about it. And as you read the Bible, if you're new to the Bible, I want to I let you know something. God gets angry about things. Right? There, there's certain things, in fact, the Bible says that God hates. And some, of you guys, like, some people say this crazy thing. They're like, we don't use that word hates. Like usually like I picture like a kindergarten teacher. They're like, we don't say that here. And I'm like, why? Hates isn't a bad word. There are some things that God hates. Hate is not the opposite of love. Apathy and indifference is the opposite of love. When you love something, you will hate what harms it. 
right? I, I always say, as a father of, of my children, growing up, I large, I mean, I don't use heroin. I never did. I was largely indifferent to the issue of heroin. I thought it was sad that people fell into it. But now that I have children growing up in our area and I see the devastating effects of what heroin does, I hate heroin. Why? Because I love my kids. Jesus hates when the glory of God is reduced down to business. He hates it. And so he chases it out. I'll tell you one of the things that I just was wrestling with personally this week knowing there are things God hates in the Bible, right? God hates injustice. God hates the murder of the innocent, the murder of babies in the name of choice. God, God hates greed, right? There's things God hates because it harms what he loves. It harms the good things in his creation. And I found myself just praying about what is it I hate and does it look at all like what God hates, Right? Like, I get angry about the way the Giants play football, <laughs> right? Like, I get, I get angry about traffic. And I started to just somewhat convicted over the things I tend to get angry about are the things that inconvenience me, but have very often very little to do with the things that God hates, as you read the Bible, you'll begin to see there are certain things as Christians that we should speak out against, that we shouldn't just be quiet about, that should grieve our hearts because it grieves the heart of God. He's angry about them and he hates them. Notice Jesus doesn't just walk in the temple and be like, I need to pray about this. He does something about it. He cleanses the corruption of the temple. And in the process, he's angry at the response of what he sees. Now, think about the contrast. Last week, we got to see water to wine Jesus. Right? Wine Jesus. This week, whip Jesus. <laughs> both are part of who God is. Right? God is both the God of the grace of wine, and God is also the God of discipline and whip. And, and here's, you know, just some of the questions this forces us to ask. Does God ever get to cleanse some of the stuff out of my life that doesn't bring him glory? Or is he just the wine Jesus? Is he just kind of grace and party? When was the last time... God said to you, I want you to let go of something that's destroying you, that's corrupting your witness. And you allowed him. Right? When was the last time God asked you to do something that you didn't want to do or you didn't fully understand and you did it because he's God? When was the last time you said, God, I want you to disciple and discipline out of me what doesn't help me look more like you? Or how, God, can you help me to be more holy? Because you didn't simply die on a cross to save me, though you did. But you died on a cross to save me and change me and make me holy so that when my friends see me, they don't just say, there's nothing different about you at all. What's so powerful about your God? I could live like that too and just go to church on Sunday. Do they ever see God's work in you that's changing your walk and your heart and your desires and is making you look more and more like Christ? Now, let's be honest. Christians can end up with a distorted view either way, right? Right? Sometimes Christians, it's all whip Jesus, right? It's all holy, holy, discipline, no grace, no compassion. No one can measure up. They're the church that's making hard for people to come to a church. And they're, they're super judgmental. One of my uh, 
my, one of my friends in, in ministry, a, a guy named Joby, he, when he was in uh, seminary, he studied in seminary and he got a job at a gym. And across from the gym, there, there was a strip club. And it ended up that the guy who owned the, the gym realized one of the ways to grow his business was to let all the dancers come in and train for free during the day. And he said, it's amazing how that fills the gym. And here he is, like, studying for seminary. He has this, he has this internship at the super disciplined, buttoned-up church. And, um, but it, it was like a, more of a whip church. And over time, he built relationship with some of the dancers who were coming in. And he ended up inviting one to the church. And, uh, you know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a classic story the way he says it, but it, she picks him up and she drives him to church. And because she's a dancer, it's a convertible and her license plate is topless fun. And he's like, I'm pulling in as an intern and this is just whatever. But he does. He brings her in. He brings her to church and he says, the looks are just horrific. And... At the end of the service, the pastor and the elder call him in, and they just, like, ream him out for bringing her. And he goes to her car, and she says, was that about me? And he was only 22 years old, and he said he lied. He's like, no, that was just something I had to deal with in there. And he said, what did you think? And she said, I've never felt more degraded in my whole life. And he says, this is a woman who was on a pole hours before. And he said, that was, the thing is, that's a church that's all whip, right, all discipline. But the other danger is being a Christian that's all wine. That's, that never calls anyone to holiness or change that you're in the, the same group of friends and no one's ever growing, no one's ever changing because our God is both. Our God is the God who meets us where we are, whether we're totally far, there's no one beyond the grace of God. But then when we meet him, what's he do? He changes us into Christ's image. He makes us holy. Oh, sorry, I jumped. I was excited too. Um, <laughs> He does. He makes us holy, changes us so that we look more and more like Jesus. Now, watch what it says. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so, so this is awesome. The disciples, they see this happen and they remember something written in Psalm 69. In Psalm 69, David says this, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, this is an amazing psalm because if you read Psalm 69 in the entire context of Psalm 69, what David's dealing with is as he is zealous for the things of God, guess what's happening? His zeal is causing resistance. That as we grow in zeal, David says, your zeal for the Lord might cause others to despise your faith. See, we don't, we don't often think that, right? We don't often think, as I love Jesus more, some people will see me love Jesus more and they'll despise it. And seeing this moment here, they remember Psalm 69. Zeal for your house will consume you, but as that's happening, there will be others who despise you. Now, we forget sometimes to tell that to new Christians, Right, Because someone becomes a Christian, and for the first time, their eyes open, their heart opens to the Lord, and for the first time, their zeal for the things of God. They're like, I love the Lord. How could no one see this? And they go out, and they try to share their faith. And what happens? Like They make a decision because they go, okay, I want to change. I want to be holy. I used to go out Friday night. We used to party like crazy. Everyone went to the bars. Now I go and tell my friends, guys, listen, I'm just at a place now. I feel convicted by the Lord. I'm not going to go out to the bars anymore. And what did, what did the friends often do? Oh, you're better than us now. It's like, no, no, no. I, I'm not better than you. I'm, I just don't want to go to the bars anymore. Oh, you're holy now. And what's happening? What's happening is Psalm 69. Zeal for the things of God will often, as you grow in them, cause some to despise you as you grow in your faith. I love how Paul says it to Timothy. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay, so key word there. We look at this verse a lot. Key word is what? all. It's, it's not 
It's not, hey, you're going to be so culturally relevant that you're going to be the one person that everyone says, you're awesome. Here's the line, and Jesus, Jesus never is afraid to be honest about this part. Right? Like, sometimes we read Jesus share the gospel. You're even going to see it in this text tonight. And you're like, Jesus needs to go to an evangelism class. <laughs> right? like, it's almost like he's trying not to, right? Because often Jesus is like, okay, you want to follow me? Take up your cross. Follow me. What's he realize? There is no following me. There is no serious faith without some persecution. All who desire to follow me, all who are zealous for me, will suffer some persecution. And, so, and sometimes we get in our heads about this and miss this because maybe this past week you took a mug out and gave it to someone and maybe that didn't go as awesome as you thought. Right? Maybe you thought people were going to be like, I actually was just wondering about church and where to go and what do you believe? I need to know more and pray with me, right? Maybe it went like, I don't go to church. Why are you bother me with this? You know? And you, you, you're like driving, you're thinking about it like, what could I have done better? What could I have done different? And maybe the answer is, you did everything perfect. Right? You did everything just right. But zeal for the Lord will at times result in misunderstanding, will at times result in some persecution, as you're faithful sometimes. So we forget this part. As you're faithful sometimes, there will be resistance. Like we, we say as a church all the time, we want to make it as hard as possible for the people of North Jersey to reject God. We want to do all we can. Like if they're going to choose hell, they're going to have to crawl over us to get there. But Satan doesn't love that. He's going to send resistance. He's going to send frustration. He'd love to discourage you. You know what he'd love for you to do? He'd love for you to have a bad experience where you say, I'm never doing the mug thing again. I'm never putting myself out there again. Or that's just clearly not my gift. Right? He'd love to discourage you. And what we want to do is say, okay, God, I trust your process. Jesus says rejoice when you're persecuted. So I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to try again and I'm going to be faithful with the opportunity you give to me. Here's the response. So the Jews said to him, for, and just, just kind of a little unpacking, when we see that phrase, the Jews, especially in John, a lot of times it's the religious leaders, it's those who are opposed to the ministry of Jesus. Um, I, I know it's different than probably how we would say it in modern culture. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? I love this. This is like, um, Jesus goes and cleanses the temple, and they're like, this is basically, who do you think you are? Like, what, what are you going to do to show us you actually have the authority to do that? This is called defensiveness, right? When, this is what happens when you're defensive. Rather than looking at the rebuke or the truth or the correction, what do you look at? Oh, what's, what's, how, do you, how can you be valid to do that? You ever have a friend who every time someone corrects them, they just go on to attack about what's wrong with the person who corrected them? They're like, yeah, but I know in fourth grade, you got really bad grades, so I'm not listening to any of that, right? Like, and they just, they just assassinate them. And all they were trying to do was correct them. So that's what they do. They go, well, who do you think you are to do that? What, what's, what sign are you going to show us? What sign are you going to do to show that you have the authority to cleanse the temple? Now, at this point, I don't think they thought Jesus was going to answer, but he does, and it's awesome, because they're like, what sign are you going to do to show you can do that? Look what Jesus says. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So they're like, what, what are you going to do to show you have the authority to cleanse the temple? And Jesus is like, and this is where you're like, it must be fun to be Jesus. Jesus is like, all right, here's a sign. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it in three days. And for them, it's like totally over their heads. See this a lot in John. A lot, a lot of times in John, what's going to happen is they have a very wooden, literalistic understanding of what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying something so awesome. So after Easter, he's going to be with Nicodemus. And he's going to go, hey, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, you want me to be born again? And that's going to be rough, right? <laughs> like a lot, John 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And they're like, we're out. <laughs> you know, he, he, he does this a lot in John where he's going to answer them something and it's just going to go, right over. So he's like, oh, you want to see a cool sign? I got one. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it in three days, and you'll see the authority I have. And they're like, it's taken 46 years to build that temple, Jesus. I don't know if you're aware of that. It was a lot of work. I know you're a carpenter. <laughs> I, you know, I don't think you can handle that. And it just goes right over. Now, last week, we saw Jesus take water, place it in ceremonial vessels, make it wine. And we saw Jesus declare in John, I'm the one who will do what the ceremonial cleansing can never do. I'm the one who can truly make you clean. This week, what's he doing? What's the temple in the Old Testament? The temple's the place of the gathering of God's people, where they'd offer sacrifice for sin, where the Spirit of God would dwell, where the nations could come in to meet God. And here Jesus is going, you know what, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up. I'm the true, uncorruptible temple of God. I am the one who will make the true offering for sin. I will do what the corrupt temple never could do. I will atone perfectly for sin. I'm the one who will not just have the dwelling of God's Spirit near the people of God, but I will actually make the people of God themselves cleansed, and I will make them temples, and I will place my Spirit in them. And then, when they have the Spirit of God from me, not the people will have to come all the way to Jerusalem to hear the good news of God's saving grace. But my people, as my spirit-filled temples, can go out to all the nations and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They can go to the ends of the earth with the good news of the gospel and make disciples that can make disciples. See what Jesus is saying? I am the true incorruptible temple. And the great sign of my power is that I will die and I will rise and I will live. And sure enough, Jesus comes and he's ministered. He ministers to us. And he's betrayed and he's handed over and he's beaten and he's whipped. Where they take a cat of nine tails, these whips that had shards of glass in the end and sometimes heavy steel balls and sometimes sharp bones and they'd whip the victim in a scourging and the balls would pulverize the people and the metal would go into their bodies, often ripping the flesh off their back. And sometimes as they whipped the victim, whole organs would come out of people. There's documented cases of that. Jesus is so physically decimated after he's scourged and beaten and whipped. He can't carry his own cross. And he did that. See, this is the amazing thing. Jesus cleanses the temple with a whip, but to cleanse us, he takes the whip. And he goes to the cross, and he dies and rises so that you and I could be cleansed and filled with the Holy Spirit and be his people with his message to the ends of the earth. He's the true temple that makes us holy. 
Let me just show you two, one incredible thing about how this ends. Remember, we said sometimes you feel like Jesus needs an evangelism course. Look at this. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust themselves to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. It's always amazing to me. Jesus knows what's in us. Isn't that incredible? Jesus knows what's in each one of us. And if you're a Christian, this is mind-blowing. If you're a Christian in this room, even though he knows exactly what is in you, he sees the worst of us, right? He sees the things we don't even want anyone to know. We can't even, we can't even think about it without feeling embarrassed again. Even though he knows what's in us, he still took the whip for us. He still took the cross for us and the grave for us and rose to forgive us and cleanse us and give us his spirit and have a work for us. But it's interesting for John. John's going to draw this line a bunch. He said like this, for John, there's a difference between belief and belief, right? Or like what John might call sign belief, well, you're just believing because you're seeing the signs, but not real saving belief. For John, belief's often a verb. The, the question is, are you believing? And two things, I think, come out of this passage that, that Jesus calls true belief. First, true belief at times will have a zeal for the Lord that causes it to suffer. I always love D.A. Carson shares about this guy in ministry who sadly fell in ministry. He committed sexual sin and disqualified himself, and they were meeting with the pastoral team and talking about it, and it was just devastating, you know, because they loved him. And um, as some time went by, they, they did a little post-op about, like, what do you think happened? And what they said was, you know what we've become convinced of? This guy grew up, he was the only son of a family of all daughters and all the daughters and the parents just doted on him and he went to youth group and all the leaders doted on him and they made him a student leader and everyone he'd get up and they'd all dote on him and then he decided he was going to go to bible school and everyone doted on him and then he did good in bible school and they doted on him some more and he decided to be a missionary and everyone was like, oh that was so awesome and everyone just celebrated him and then he came back and he got a job at the church he grew up in as a pastor and everyone just thought it was all so awesome and he just did what he always did. Some lady came along who wasn't his wife, and he, she doted on him. And what they said was, never in his life did he ever make the hard choice for Christ. It was just it was easy. He went to this and went to this and went to this, and never did Christ call him to do the hard thing. This is what I always watch for with my own kids, because I'm just waiting for their faith to cost them. And I'm going to go, yes, it's real. <laughs> it costs them a friend. It costs them an opportunity. It costs them their reputation. It costs them something. And then I celebrate and I go, their faith is real. For John, real faith at times will cost us, will suffer. Second for John, real faith goes beyond salvation to where it says, God, cleanse me. Make me increasingly holy. Like the prayer David prays, show me if there's anything offensive in me. You ever pray? That's a scary prayer to pray. God, show me the offensive stuff in me and chase it out. Change me. I always think, for me, the most helpful way to think of holiness Holiness means cut out. So when I was a kid, I played sports. I know, you can tell by this. <laughs> You're like, of course you did. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago. And every once in a while, I'd have a good game, and I'd score some goals. And what we would do back then, is it was like pre-internet. You have to remember, we get newspapers and we'd have to go get the newspaper. And what I would do is if I scored a bunch of goals and they mentioned me in the newspaper, I'd cut the article out and I'd put it in this little book where I kept all those articles. To be holy means you're saying, 
God, cut my life out and use it for you. All of it. I want all of my life cut out for you. And so my prayer is we look at our lives We say, I want a faith where God can cleanse me. I want to follow him at times, even in the hard things, and I want to be cut out for him because he took the whip for me. He went to the cross for me, and he's changing me. Let's pray and worship that good God together. God, thank you that you're the God of incredible grace, Lord, that you care about our salvation, but you also, Lord, want us to change You want us to meet you and grow. God, would we have an accurate view of you, Lord, both the God at the wedding celebration, but also the God of the whip who calls us to be holy, but then takes the whip upon himself for us. And so, Lord, would we realize that grace is free, but it's not cheap? And, Lord, would we pray the prayer that David prays? Would you search us and show us any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting? God, help us to be people who love to change, who rejoice when you say something hard to us that needs to change in our lives. And Lord, I pray specifically for those here tonight for the first time who realize how much you love them, that you could have come with a whip for them, but you took it. You went to a cross to die for their sins, to cleanse the corruption in them. And then God, if they're willing to come to you and believe, real belief, You'll change them. You'll give them your spirit. You'll use their lives for your glory, and they'll live for you. We ask all of that, God, for your glory, for our joy, and the good of those all around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to worship. Praising my risen 
sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. of every blessing to my heart. Let's sing that together. To my heart, Lord, to sing your praise. And come down fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. For songs of loudest praise And teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Breeze of mountain fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging
the wall they'd love to pray for you uh, praying for you guys this week as you go out and and um, and share and hopefully you'll pray about it. if there's an opportunity for you to um, worship at one and serve at one and I'll trust however God leads you there and so let me pray for us be- before we head out tonight God thank you that you're good and you're faithful um, thank you that you are the God of salvation who meets us with the celebration of grace but then doesn't leave us there. God changes us to become more loving and more kind and more just and more compassionate, to hate the things you hate, to love the things you love. And God, would you continue to transform us so that we'd be holy for you? We ask that for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you guys have a great night and see you next, next week.